how to find optimal permutations for generalized type 2 Feistel schemes. Um, this is joint work between Victor Cochois, Clément Gomez, and Gael Doma, and Gael will give the talk. And so this paper wins the runner-up award for the longest title. <laughs> <laughs> there is tomorrow one paper with one character more in the title, but you almost won. Okay. Well, thank you for the introduction. So this talk is about uh, type 2 festival permutation and uh, type 2 festival schemes and how to find the best permutations uh, in the Faisal. So I assume you already know what Faisal network uh, do. You are... Your task as a designer is to construct a cipher, a permutation, or something like this. And the states may be, the state may be big, so you do. Mm, I, I will only do the part of the word. I will only do this on half the block, and then to influence the other block, I will XOR my output to the other half. And since it is not enough, oh no problem, I iterate, and this is quite a popular design. And it was generalized at the, the end of the 1980s, and this time, instead of uh, dividing the state into two blocks, you divide it into k blocks, which means you have more functions, but they are much simpler. And after that, you swap in some manner the different blocks. So in the original paper, uh, the swap was simply a rotation, but we can, we can actually do more than that. And again, this is a very popular design with different uh, number of blocks. Uh, but the problem with this construction is uh, how many rounds do you, do you have to do before you have some kind of diffusion? So here, what do I mean by diffusion? I'm talking about uh, what's called maximum diffusion round. And basically, you look, for example, at the first block, and you follow the different hours, and you will count how many blocks you have uh, influenced after a certain number of rounds. So here, after one round, you have influenced two blocks, then three, then five, uh, and I think that's seven. And here, after five turns, you influence every block. And so you say that the diffusion round for the first block is five. And you do that for every other block. Here we have, here we need six rounds, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea behind this criterion is, is the kind of a first sieve uh, criterion for uh, choosing a permutation for a Feistel network because it's for the first thing because it's very easy to compute, but it's maybe not exactly very precise to assess the security of the cipher. But it's uh, nonetheless uh, linked with uh, many attacks, which are very powerful against uh, generalized Feistel structure, like impossible attacks and saturation attacks. And of course, it was done for encryption, but you can do the same for decryption. And you say that the maximum diffusion round, or DR for short, of the permutation, pi here is the, this permutation, so the pointer is one out of battery. Um, you say so that the diffusion round for this permutation is six. And so there is a, a seminal paper on how to improve the diffusion of Faisal network, which was done by Suzaki and Minematsu and presented at FSC 2010. And what was their main focus? Was their, the idea that, that the permutation you use, oh, you have two kinds of blocks. You have blocks that are at the input of a function and blocks that are at the output. And the blocks that help diffusion are the even ones and the odd ones play a less important role, shall we say. So the, uh, the heuristic would be that, oh, between two ones, let's, let's swap the roles of these two kind of blocks. That's what we call even odd general Feistel networks, where you send the even blocks to the odd blocks and vice versa. And they conducted a exhaustive search of a, general, of a permutation of two 16 block and proved that contrary to uh, the first results, here, you will simply uh, rotate the blocks. By using a different permutation, you can actually uh, have a much faster diffusion. And uh, moreover, they gave a generic construction with a diffusion uh, logarithmic in the number of blocks. And so what are our contribution? Our contribution is we give an upper bound, and more than that, a constructive upper bound on the 
how many even of even odd GFS we have up to some notion of equivalence. Uh, using this constructive method, we can do the exhaustive search for up to 24 blocks. When, uh, be, when exhaustive search is out of reach, we define a new criterion to reduce the search space, which we call collision free def. And in a few words, it means that we want to have a special criterion for the first few rounds of diffusion. Uh, we'll also revisit the generic construction of Suzaki and Minimatsu, where we can, in some cases, improve the result by one round. That's it, uh, that are the bottom results here. We go from 12 to 11 and 14 to 13. And we also study the case of uh, non-even odd permutations. So I said we uh, study uh, GFS up to equivalence. What is equivalence of GFS? It's very simple. You have a GFS, and let's say you want to exchange, exchange the walls of different blocks, so you swap them. That doesn't change the cryptographic property. You are changing. You are just changing how you number your blocks. So this is an equivalence relation. But in fact, if you do that naively, you end up with something that doesn't look like uh, the type two general file style anymore. That is where you have this structure of uh, one function every two blocks. So to keep this structure, you have to permute using a special kind of uh, permutation, which we call a permutation of pairs, where you basically swap blocks by packets of two. Uh, that's for the notation. I call this set SKP. K is the number of blocks, and P is for pair. And so we have a notion of pair equivalence, that is pi 1 and pi 2, the, permuta the, the per two permutations here are equivalent if and only if uh, they are conjugated with each other with one of these pair equivalent permutations. So how many uh, permutations do we have up to this notion of equivalence? Well, the first thing to notice is that if you have an even odd permutation, you can write it as uh, two uh, smaller permutations over k over two elements. Simply, the first one tells you where you send the even elements, and the second tells you where you send the odd elements. And so this means that the number of classes, well, is trivially upper bounded by how many permutations you have. And uh, the lower bound is actually uh, comes actually from the fact that since you're uh, using equivalence relation on the SEO set, which have the k over two factorial square element, and you uh, have um, permuted, you, um, ah, sorry. You have equivalence up to a set with k over two elements, that is permutation of pairs, big blocks. So you have in total at least k over two factorials um, equivalence classes, but in fact the idea is that you don't have to exhaust all these big set. You can reduce the search space where the first permutation pi one can be simply in, in uh, one single one in a conjugacy class of S k over two. It is regular conjugacy class, and so you save up a k over two factorial that to replace by the number of conjugacy classes in the permutation group over k over two element. And to see how big uh, this saving is, uh, you, you go from factorial k over two to something that is in big O of exponential square root of k. And so uh, we did exhaustive search, search using this method. So here from six to 24 are the best, of the diffusion round of the best permutation that exists. So up to 16, that are the results of Susaki and Minematsu. And after that, that is our results. And we also computed how many classes there are that are optimal. And we can see a, bit, a, little, a, thing, a little bit strange. That is, for 18 blocks, there are only two optimal permutations. For 22, there are four. And they have a diffusion round of eight. But in between, there is that 20. That, is a, that has a diffusion round of nine, but there are a huge number of them. And so what happens here? In fact, there is uh, 
a problem with uh, lava bond, it is that before any doing actual exhaustive search, you, you, you can uh, have a lower bond on how many rounds you will need. And this lower bond, in fact, is, uh, can be seen as follows. So you, for each round, you will be counting how many uh, blocks you have influenced. So here, after zero round, you have computed, you have a single, um, let's call it an active block. Here you have one, two, three, five, and if you were to continue naively, you would think, oh, that's a Fibonacci sequence. I'm going to have an eight. No, I have a seven. Why? Because there has been a collision between two blocks. At least you have something that you would have expect to have this kind of uh, half the block separate in two with respect to diffusion. But here, that does not happen because you have uh, two, uh, two different paths influence the same block. And so you have this lower bound, say, if you have no collisions, you have the Fibonacci sequence, and so basically you have that, uh, if you look the Fibonacci number, the DR, the DRs Fibonacci numbers uh, times two must be at least equal to the number of blocks. And so based on this ID, when the exhaustive search is intractable, we try to reduce the search pace to peer mutation where the number of collisions in the first few rounds uh, is very small or does not happen at all, in fact. And so there's this new criterion which we call collision free depth or CD for short, which is uh, basically the number of rounds uh, before any collision happen. So here the collision free depth is, for this particular block, is three, but if you were to begin on the block before, uh, this is four, sorry, but if you were to begin on the blocks to the left, that would be three. So the, the collision free depth for this particular permutation is three. And so we, for all the permutations, we computed uh, what was the collision free depth and classified it. So here are the results. Uh, because of that Fibonacci, Fibonacci bound, we also have a bound on the collision free depth, which is given on the third row. And so from this result, we can see that, uh, okay, there, are, except for maybe for the 18, but since there are only two permutations, uh, maybe an outlier here, uh, we can always almost always find uh, permutations with uh, high collision free depth, which means that it's maybe a relevant criterion. But again, it seems that most permutations don't have uh, a very high collision free depth. So there is some kind of trade-off between how much, how big the search space is and uh, the optimality of your results you may find. And in particular, there is a very interesting case, case, which is the case for k equals 26. So as I said before, this case is uh, too big for exhaustive search. But if you look at the Fibonacci bond, 26 divided by 2 is 13, and 13 is a Fibonacci number. Uh, I realize there may be a problem with the bound here that maybe not Fibonacci of eight, but maybe Fibonacci of eight minus one. But never mind, the, the reasoning is correct. And so if you wanted to have a permutation on, 20, on 26 uh, blocks with a diffusion amount of eight, you would need an optimal collision free depth, that is no collision until the last round. And we can actually test if such a thing exists using exhaustive search. So we perform exhaustive search for any permutation with a collision free depth at least four, and the best result we found was 10. So this proves that the best, uh, co um, the best permutation cannot have a diffusion amount of eight. It must be either nine or 10. And so we transform our algorithm uh, to perform this uh, random search, and we use it with a collision free depth of three, which was the biggest, the biggest value we had not tested yet, and found one result with nine, which is then optimal. So it means that the, the collision free depth is indeed a useful criterion for, uh, search, for finding permutations. And to look a little bit, to have a look a bit more detail in uh, what we do, 
uh, if you have your Firestorm network here, if you streamline the things a bit and look at what happens on the block zero, you have that block zero influence, well, block zero when you go into the function, but also block three, three influences six, etc., etc. And so basically the idea of collision free death is the number of ones, uh, you, the number of steps you can do before the given number appears twice on one of the leaves. But in fact, uh, this representation is a bit uh, tedious to handle because you have that kind of uh, unbalanced graph. And uh, as was already done in the Suzaki and Minematsu paper, you can represent uh, the Firestone network by considering blocks by uh, sets of two. So you, are, you consider only a kind of super block that we group block zero and one, block two and three, block four and five, block six and seven. And this nicely simplifies into a balance binary uh, tree. And the advantage of this representation, well, it's a binary tree, binary trees are cool. You have fewer nodes because you're grouping uh, uh, blocks by two. So overall it's uh, something really m m more simple than what you had before. But the, uh, the, inco the major inconvenient is that, uh, is that you, it does not represent a unique permutation because here you lost the information of uh, when you say that the, the super block zero influences the super block one, that is the edge on the right, <coughs> you do not know if this is done with a uh, with an with a even to odd edge or with an odd to even edge. So you need additional information which you can represent as a graph coloring of this tree with two colors, one for even to odd and one for an odd to even. And uh, actually what was used in the, the Suzaki and Minematsu paper to construct this kind of graph is the so-called De Bruyne graph. And uh, De Bruyne graph is simply uh, a graph with two to the n uh, nodes. The nodes are labeled using the, all the binary numbers with n, um, n bits. So here is the case for n equals to two. So you have zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. And you draw an edge uh, as, a, as the following. You take, for example, zero, zero, you drop the leftmost bit, so you end up with zero. And if you are, and you add the label on the e on the edge to form the the new label of the the label of the new node. So zero zero drops the leftmost zero, add a zero to the right, to the right. Sorry, you end up still on zero zero. Zero zero drops the leftmost zero, add a one to the right, you end up on zero one, etc. etc. And if you translate that in terms of, uh, of our tree representation, it, uh, it simply means that you're filling, you're filling uh, the tree with the least possible numbers. So this is kind of a way to avoid uh, collision, collisions on the first ones. And how do you color it? Well, for this particular example, you don't have much choice of to swapping uh, the color of blues and red. So blue, uh, for example, means you go from even to odd, and red means you go for, um, from odd to even. Um, this also means that on the true representation, you go left means, right, means red, and right means blue. But this is the, col the coloring used in the Suzaki and Minematsu paper, but actually you can exhaust uh, all the possible coloring with a complexity of two to the k over four. And uh, we did this for k up to uh, 128, and we uh, obtained better results. We can gain one round for the 64 and 128 uh, blocks um, for the value of k, 64 and 128. And so until now I've, I've spoken about 
the the upper bound, the exhaustive surge, the criterion of collision free depth, and uh, the graph coloring uh, ID. But I have not spoken about the non-even odd permutations, so I will give a few words about this. Uh, basically, uh, most of the previous most of the previous ideas still work. That is, uh, since they are based on graph, you can define the graph for the Faisal, you can follow the line that works roughly the same, so collision free depth uh, stays the same. You can adapt the graph coloring IDs. Of course, you still have the question of what graph do you choose. And for the number of uh, classes, so in the even odd case, you had this inequality. And for the general case, you have something that is like this. So what most interesting is the upper bound. Uh, NK is the number of conjugacy class, and the second is uh, the number of uh, representative of the right coset of SK mod, uh, mod of the K, K blocks permutation modulo the permutation of pairs where you swap permutations uh, by uh, by super blocks. In fact, so we can again do exhaustive search. We did this. And we found, and surprisingly, as was noticed in the Suzaki and Minimetsu's paper, that non-even odd permutations are, genera are generally worse than even odd permutations. So in conclusion, we studied type two generalized Faisal structures, where in fact we uh, studied permutations up to pair equivalence. We gave an upper bound on them, a constructive upper bound, which allowed us to run exhaustive search for up to 24 blocks for the even odd case or 20 for the general case. And we introduce this criteria, the collision depth criterion, which is the criterion when you want to avoid collision in the first few rounds. And finally, we analyze the graph constructions on the De Bruyne graph and improve the result for k equals 64 and 128. Thank you for your, present, for your attention. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much. No questions. Then I will ask you a question. So you look at the optimal diffusion. Did they have special structure, or do they look more like random graphs? Sorry? The optimal yeah. solution, do they have special structure if you look at them, or are they random? Uh, I don't know, in fact. Well, that depends. For some number of blocks, there are the thousands of solutions, so we did not look at all of them. And uh, for the k equals 18, there are only two, but I don't remember if they have any structure. So I also have a question about your definition of full diffusion. So, I mean, of course, the, the left-right trick solves it a bit, but I mean, if there's a linear dependency, just it goes to an XOR to the next round. Um, yes. That's also seen as full diffusion, but of course, if it goes to an F function, there is much more diffusion among the bits. Does your analysis take this into account, or you just say... An no, you, we just see the F function as a kind of a black box, and we assume there are... But you don't distinguish between an XOR and an F function diffusion, or...? Mm, no. Okay. Any more questions? If not... Uh, Let's thank uh, Gavin and all the other speakers of this session for interesting talks. <laughs>